see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Sunday, April 26th. It was fair in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a call reporting a shooting. There was no trace of the suspect. We had to find him. You signed up for blood, huh? Yeah. I've been meaning to put my name up there. I just did. Good. Frank, what are you doing? Weighing my stuff. Oh, yeah. I guess everybody ought to know what his stuff weighs, huh? You bet. Look at that, Joe. Two pounds, one ounce. The gun alone. I see you got your handkerchief in there, too. I carry it, don't I? Yeah. You know, these things are heavy. Yeah. Uh-oh. Four pencils? Yeah, press kind of hard. How do you like that? Eight pounds, five, six, seven. Eight pounds, nine ounces. No wonder I'm tired at night. And at night when I'm carrying a flashlight, that weighs more, too. You got yours? Yeah. Let me have it. Mine's heavier than that. Nine pounds, ten ounces. No wonder I'm so tired. You figure carrying all that stuff around is what makes you tired, huh? Well, absolutely. Well, I don't see how you arrive at that. What do they do in any big race? They give the jockey a handicap, don't they? They load him up with lead weights in his saddlebags. Now, you think about that. Yeah. That's why those horses are tired at the end of a race, packing that weight around. It's usually not more than nine or ten pounds. Makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, sure. This year we'll lay eight to five on you in the derby, huh? Hot shot. What do you got? Shooting on East Perendo. Let's go. Here. Right. Come on. 11.45 p.m. We swung out of the city hall garage and headed south on Main Street. Code 3, red light and siren. We heard the police radio operator dispatching ambulance G13 to the address we were headed for. It was 11.52 p.m. when we pulled up in front of 1981 East Perendo. We went around to the back of the house where we found the officers from Unit 1A6. We checked with them and got the information that they'd come up with. They suggested that they canvass the immediate vicinity for any information on the assailant. You doctors? No, sir. Police officers. The ambulance is on the way. If I could just stop the bleeding. It's his chest. Has he been conscious at all since you've been here? Just for a second, right after I got here. Did he say anything? I heard the shot and came right over. He was laying on the floor right here. Did he say anything? Help me. That's all he said. Help me. I didn't know what to do. I got this towel from the sink and tried to stop the bleeding. This is my handkerchief. That's all I had. Can't do much, but I had to try. I had to. Keep pressing. That's all I can think of. Keep pressing. Try to stop it. Try. You feel all right, sir? Sure, I'm all right. Got to keep pressing. Press. Let me get in there. Come on. Hey. I got it. It's the excitement. I can't seem to get my breath. Something we can get for you? Thanks. I'd like a glass of water. Sure. I'd rather you wouldn't touch that, sir. Hmm? Oh, fingerprints. There's one up there. Is that all right? Yes, sir. That'll be all right. Say, I did test that towel. Hope I didn't hurt anything. Didn't mean to. No, sir. That's perfectly all right. What's your name, sir? Paul West. I live next door, right across the driveway. Gray House. Mm-hmm. What if you...
you can tell us what happened here. Sure, I want to help all I can. Joe. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, Lynch. Yeah, I think he's coming around. Is he coming too? Did he say something? Who shot him? What's his name? Stone. 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 Maybe he'll talk to me. He knows me. We're friends. Let me talk to him. All right, keep back a minute, West. Just want to help. Stone, we want to help you. Can you tell us who shot you? What's he saying? Giving you the name? I keep out of this West. Stone? How about it, Frank? He's dead. Did he say anything? Yeah, not much help, though. Yeah. Ask me not to shoot him again. According to the next door neighbor, Paul West, the victim was 48 years old. He was not married and he lived by himself. The ambulance crew returned to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital after making out a DOA report and the coroner's office was asked to pick up the body. Coroner's deputies Maxwell and Martinez arrived. Before Charles Stone's body was removed, the crew from the crime lab photographed the scene and Frank and I signed the property receipt for the money and personal effects found on the body. We asked the crime lab to check a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver found on the floor under the kitchen stove. There was one empty cartridge in the cylinder. We put in a call to gun records, but we found nothing on the gun. A call to R&I on the victim of the shooting turned up nothing. Latent fingerprints found nothing on the murder weapon. The crime lab crew found several tread marks of automobile tires and one good impression left in the soft earth in the alley behind the house. A plaster cast was made of the imprint and it was returned to the office to be booked as evidence. We checked with the officers in Unit 1A6, but they said that in canvassing the neighborhood, they'd been unable to come up with any new leads. No, sir, I can't think of anyone that would want to kill Charles, not a soul. What kind of business was Stone in? Owned a print shop, Stone Press, over on the east side. Was he in business by himself? What do you mean? Well, do you have any partners? No, Charlie owned it right out, had the pink slip, you might say. Uh, can you give us the address? Sure. Biggest print shop on the east side. Printed just about everything. Posters, display cards, things like that. He gave me some calling cards last Christmas. Stone have anybody in the shop with him? Any employees? Well, there's the Becker kids, Pete and Alvin. They work in the shop, did they? Yeah, I've been with them, I guess it's about uh, five years. How's he seem to get along with them? Fine. I never heard about any trouble. They're kind of friends of the family. Charlie was pretty fond of them. Do you have any personal enemies? Maybe because of the business? No, not that I know of. How long have you known Stone? It's been about 40 years. We grew up together. Uh -huh. His father and mine built these houses at the same time. Charlie and I went to school together, belonged to the same clubs. Yes, sir. We've lived right here side by side all this time. We were friends, Charlie and me, good friends. You gotta catch the person who did this. You gotta get him. We'll do what we can, sir. Say, I just happened to think. What's that, sir? Maybe I shouldn't say it, but it could be. What's that, West? You think that maybe Charlie did this himself, suicide? Well, we don't know yet, sir. Just a thought, you know. Now, you said earlier that Stone had been over to your house tonight. Yeah, that's right. Do you have any special reason for that visit? We didn't need any reason. Charlie was always welcome, always. Yes, sir. Of course, tonight, Sunday, we had the game. Sir? Bridge. We always play bridge on Sunday night, never miss. I see. Now, what'd you do after you heard the shot? I called to him, asked him if he was all right. Didn't get any answer, so I came in, found him right on the floor. Where he was when you came in. You're the one who put in the call? Yeah. I called the operator and told her to get an ambulance right over. That Charlie had been shot. Told her to send a policeman. What time was it when Stone left your house? Must have been about 11.15 or so. Earlier than usual. We most always play till midnight. I guess Charlie got miffed about that grand slam I made. Then Joanne kidded him about the woman. What woman's that? It wasn't anything. I went out and looked. Nobody there. Sir? Well, a couple of times Charlie thought he heard a woman coughing outside the window by his house. He went over to the window to look, but there wasn't anybody there. Did you hear this coughing? No, not really. After Charlie started talking about it, I thought I did, but I went out to look at it. There wasn't anything there. His imagination, that's all. He was mad because of the slam. Well, did you hear anything when you were out in the back? No, not a soul. Do you know if Stone has any relatives in Los Angeles? No. He hasn't? Hasn't got any any place. None at all. Always kind of worried him. Why is that? Well, he used to say that he didn't have any folks to leave his things to. The house, print shop. Mm -hmm. He made a will, though. All legal. With a seal and all. Official. He used to talk to me about it. Do you know who the beneficiary was? Not now. What's that? Well, I knew who it was, but he was going to change it. Said he was going to put a new name on it. Did he say whose? No, just said I'd be surprised. We started searching through the victim's effects for the will. In one of the bottom drawers of the dresser,
dresser, we found a locked tin box. In a box of paper clips, we found a key that fit. In the bottom of the tin box, we found the will of Charles Stone. In it, he left the house and the rest of his possessions to a Mrs. Margaret Becker. The print shop and the business he left to Mrs. Becker's sons, Peter and Alvin. The will was dated three years previously. On a separate piece of paper, we found an address for a Mrs. Margaret Becker, the Lone Star Motel on Sepulveda Boulevard. 12.40 a.m. We affixed the public administrator's seal, which the coroner's deputy had left with us, to the door of the victim's house. We talked with the wife and daughter of the neighbor, Paul West, and they confirmed the story that he'd given us. On the way to talk to the Becker woman, we stopped and called the office. They checked the name through R&I, but they came up with no identification. We called Sergeant J. Allen at the crime lab, and he told us that the tire marks found at the rear of the victim's house were made by three Firestone tires and one truck tire. He said that the cast they'd made was of the truck tire, which was the left front wheel. 1.15 a.m., we arrived at the Lone Star Motel. There was a car parked in front of the manager's cottage, and we were missing no bets. Now the motor's cold. The tires don't match. Well, it was a nice try. Yeah. It's late. Yeah. 115. Mm-hmm. Probably asleep. What's the matter? Can't you read? The sign says no vacancy. That means full up. N-O, that means no. Waking somebody up at this yes, hour. Yes, ma'am. And don't ask me if I know some place where you can stay, because I don't. Miss Becker. How do you know my name? Police officers, ma'am. Well, what are you doing around here? I run a clean place. No trouble. License is paid up. Nothing's wrong. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. What about? You know a man named Charles Stone. Well, what are you asking that for? We'd like to know. And I want to know why you're asking. What's this about? Something happened to Charlie? Is that why you're out here? Yes, ma'am. Well, what's wrong? Well, it's pretty serious, ma'am. Go ahead, you can tell me. Well, he's dead, Miss Becker. Come in. What's all the racket about? Who are these fellas? Who are you? What are you doing here? They're policemen. We don't need you. We got everything cleaned up, took care of it ourselves. Nobody sent for you. We took care of them. No, Daddy, they're here about Charles. Charlie? Charlie Stone? Yes, sir. Charlie here? Where? He's not here, Daddy. Something happened to him. What? He's dead. Dead? Charlie? Yeah. Uh, what happened? Accident? No, sir. Oh. Poor Charlie Stone. Too bad. Nice boy. I thought you were here about the fellow number eight. Loud. What's that? A man from Texas came in tonight. He was pretty drunk. We had to take him in. Daddy put him to bed. He was pretty drunk. Heavy, too. That's what he thought you were here for. Couldn't even get out of his car. Margaret had a pocket for him. Loud. Real drunk. Wore his pants inside his boots. You own a car, ma'am? Yeah, it's a red Ford. It's right outside. What was it you wanted to see me about? A few questions we'd like to ask you. About Charles? Yes, ma'am. When was the last time you saw him? Must have been a couple of weeks ago. Saw him last week. April 22nd. Went fishing down to the pier. What was your relationship with Mr. Stone? Good friends, that's all. We knew each other almost all our lives. I used to live next door to him. We went through school together. I always thought they was going to get married. Charlie was a good boy. You see much of him lately? Not too much. I've been busy here with Daddy. Charles had other things to do. Moved next door to him December 14th. Exactly 42 years ago, come winter. You know if he had any enemies, anyone that didn't like him? No. Can't think of anyone who didn't like Charlie. Didn't catch a thing off the pier. Bad bait. You been home all evening? Yeah. Why do you ask that? Just routine. You think I had something to do with it? That it? No, ma'am. Peanuts. That's what you need. What's that, sir? Peanut anchovies. That's what you need for pear fishing. You say it's routine, but I don't like it. You're coming in here waking us up with a lot of questions. We've had a bad night. That drunk coming in, we've been on the go since then. A few years ago, a fellow used to be able to get a lot of pinheads. Not many anymore. You want to make any accusations, you talk to Paul West. You just talk to him. Try your routine questions there. Paul West? Yeah, Charlie's neighbor. He never liked Charlie, never. If anybody heard Charlie, it was Paul. Why do you say that, Mrs. Becker? Years ago, Charlie was sweet on Paul's sister. On the way back from the beach one night, there was an accident, and Paul's sister was killed. He never forgave Charlie. Always held him to blame. Why was that, Miss Becker? Well, Charlie was driving. Paul hated Charlie for it. And now the thing with the daughter, Paul didn't like that either. Somebody did something to Charlie. You routine the man next door. You talk to Paul West. 
Now get out of here. I want to get some sleep. You got any more questions, come back in the morning. I'll talk to you then. You get out of here now. What do you mean, the thing with Mr. West's daughter? All right, I'll tell you that. Then you get out of here. All right, if you would, please. Well, a couple of months ago, Joanne came home, divorced her husband and moved home. Well, right away, Charlie got sweet on her and Paul didn't like it, didn't like it at all. You ever say anything to Mr. Stone about it? You bet he did. They had a lot of arguments, lots of them. You just talk to Paul West. He's the one you want to talk to. Now, good night. We'll be back in the morning, ma'am. I'm going fishing tomorrow. They're getting pinheads now. I'll be here. Don't worry. I'll talk to you then. daughter? Yeah. Better check it out, huh? Yeah. All that stuff about the text and how they strike you. Didn't bother me. Why? I don't know. Didn't you believe it? Well, I don't know whether I believe it or not. It just didn't sit right with me. Well, let's talk to him. She said number eight. had been identified as being a Firestone make. The fourth was a truck tire. The car we'd found in the carport of cabin number eight had tires that matched the description. 1.26 a.m. We went back to talk to Margaret Becker. I'd like to know just what this is all about, the way you're snooping around asking questions. Ain't anybody going to let an old man sleep around here? What are you fellas doing here again? They got some more idiotic questions, Daddy. Now, why don't you come right out with it? You think I had something to do with Charlie being dead, isn't that it? No, ma'am, we told you before, this is just a routine investigation. We're trying to get the facts. And you think I did it? We didn't say that. Not in so many words you didn't, but that's what you meant. I bet you found that will. That's what made you think it was me. Isn't that what made you think it was me? You knew about the will, did you? Certainly I knew about it. Charles told me when he had it drawn up. Said he didn't have anybody else. Wanted to see that me and the boys were taken care of. Too bad about Charlie Stone. He was a good boy. Gonna take care of Margaret. You ever say anything to you about changing the will? Yeah, he told me about it last time I saw him. Had lunch together, he told me then. Did he tell you what changes he was going to make? No, not right out. He didn't have to, I could tell. The way he's been acting lately, I could tell. So could I. What do you mean, the way he's been acting lately? Is there anything wrong? Well, this thing with Joanne, I told you about that. Charlie's been acting like a fool, falling all over, gushing sweet talk was silly. Yeah? Yeah, well, she had him in a trance, and her just 25 and him 48. Talk about your spring and winter. That was them. How'd Joanne feel about this? Well, how did you expect her to feel? She thought Charlie leave her the money, house, everything. She went right along with it, real brazen. Sir. What? Big pardon? You said earlier that you thought Stone and your daughter might get married. You bet. They was always in love. Daddy, that's not true. It is too. Right after that no good decker walked out on Maggie, then she and Charlie started seeing each other again. Went real nice, too. Then Joanna came into town, and Charlie Stone took up with her. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Stone made out his will, leaving everything to Margaret and the kids. Then he decided to change it. You knew about the will, too, didn't you? Sure. Charlie and I were good friends. We used to go fishing all the time. Talked a lot. I told him he was wrong to even think of changed the will. Told me he was wrong. What time did you say the car from Texas got in? About 10, 15. Well, ma'am, is it possible that the car could have been taken out without you knowing it? That ain't right, Margaret. What? It wasn't that late. It was only about 8 when he came in. I remember because I went to bed at 8.30. Put him to bed, then came back and went to bed myself. Had to get some sleep on the of going fishing in the morning. You're pretty sure about that time. You bet. I remember because I went to bed and turned on the radio. Listened to that radio program about the detective. Fell asleep before the end. Never did find out who killed the king with a pink paper knife. What was your daughter doing when you came back? Just sitting there. She went out with the car away and I went to bed. How long was she outside, would you remember? No, no. A few minutes, I guess. Well, could you tell us a little closer than that? Not very well. 
I told you I went to sleep. Didn't hear her come in. Just take a couple minutes to put the car away, just back in number eight. Miss Becker, I wonder if you'd get dressed, please. We'd like to talk to you downtown. What for? We have a report from our crime lab. They found some tire tracks in back of Stone's house tonight. They were fresh tracks. Those tracks match the car that you got parked back there. And you think I drove the car over to Charlie's? Well, we'd like to talk about it. Why? Why would I want to do a thing like that? Why would I want to kill Charlie? Maybe because he was going to cut you out of his will. Looks like a pretty good motive. You're both out of your minds. All right, ma'am. We'll lay it out for you. You better do that. Make an accusation you can't back up. Well, the way the evidence looks, ma'am, we got a pretty good case. The way it looks to us, you took the car and drove over to Stone's. He was next door playing cards, so you waited in the kitchen for him to come back. A couple of times you coughed while you were waiting. He heard you. He came over to the window to see who it was. Because it was dark, he couldn't see you. I haven't heard a story like that since I stopped reading fairy tales. He came home and you killed him. Then you heard West next door. He came over to see what it was. You went out the back way to the car that you'd parked in the alley. You drove back here. That's the way it looks to you, is it? Yes, ma'am, that's the way it looks. You want to get dressed now? You figure she killed Charlie Stone? Yes, sir. You going to arrest Margaret? You want to talk to her about it. You want to take her down to jail? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Well, I'll go and put my clothes on. It isn't necessary for you to go with her, sir. She's not going. What? I killed Charlie Stone. Daddy. You killed him? Yep. I got tired of how he was treating Margaret. Got good and tired. Him talking about how he was going to change his will. Couldn't let him do that. Just killed him. Got in the car and went over and did it. You drove the car? Yeah, tough too, that automatic. Not used to it. Then the traffic, tough. What was this about you going to bed? Oh, I, I just made that up. I came in and I thought about Charlie Stone. And I went over and killed him. I'm an old man. He ain't going to be around much longer. Somebody's got to take care of Margaret and the boys. Thought Charlie Stone was going to do it. Then he changed his mind. Had to stop him. Yeah. I went over to talk to him. Tried to reason with him. He wouldn't listen. Charlie Stone was stubborn. Real stubborn. Finally, I got real mad and killed him. Then I came back in and went to bed. What time was all this, sir? Huh? What time did you go over to Stone's? Right after the fellow from Texas got in there. Guess it was about nine. What time did you kill him? Uh, about 10.30 or so. Had to wait for him to get through plane cars. Had to wait for him to come home. Why are you doing this, Daddy? Why am I doing it? I said somebody had to take care of the kids. Somebody had to take care of you. I'm an old man. I ain't much use to anybody. All right, come on, Miss Becker. You want to get dressed? She ain't the one. I did it. I killed Charlie Stone. I already confessed. Why don't you believe me? Why don't you arrest me now? I did it. I'm afraid not, sir. You got the times a little mixed up. Stone wasn't killed at 10.30. No, he's just trying to help me, but he doesn't have to. Him and me were both here tonight. Neither one of us left. I was in bed and asleep at midnight. Why do you say that? What? Why do you think that Stone was killed around midnight? I didn't say that. You said you were home and in bed at midnight, didn't you? Well, it's just a figure of speech. I think I talked enough to you. I don't have to say anything more. I'm going to see a lawyer about it. You got no right. She didn't do it. I'm the one. I'm the one. Did you kill him, Mrs. Becker? Get old, nobody believes you. Miss Becker. Yeah? Did you kill him? Yeah, I did it. It wasn't because of the money, though. You've got to believe that. It wasn't because of the money. Ma'am. I loved him. Deep in my heart, I loved him. I always did, even when we were kids. I thought he was going to marry me, and then he met Joanne. You shouldn't have done it, Margaret. I loved him. He didn't want me. He wanted Joanne. You know what that's like? What's that? Hey, you love somebody, and them not want you. Begins to eat at you, and pretty soon you can't stand it anymore. That's why I did it. Not for the money. It wasn't for the money. You understand? I, I just wanted him. Yeah. You believe that, don't you? I never wanted his money, just him. You believe that? Really doesn't make any difference, does it? How do you mean? You didn't get either one. August 6th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree.